and then okay ready okay. to share screen we good ready to share screen and we're, we're looking forward to it all right well let me let me start off by saying that this was a highly planned very flexible trip that um, Rich, who was our driver, um, and Jim Routh and myself, and originally we were gonna have John Harris and Dale Swanberg go along with us. And then that nasty little COVID-19 hit and kind of put uh, an end to our plans last year. And then as things progressed this year, we decided to make a go for it. We were all vaccinated, both our shots. Uh, I, I heard rumors that uh, the planes were kind of going half full. And so we, uh, we decided to go for it. Um, I spent way too much time trying to plan the best locations for everything and timing and, uh, and we decided in the end that um, just we'd be prepared and every night reevaluate and go from there, which we did. So uh, we had a lot of background information that helped guide us, but um, the long distance planning kind of was not needed. <laughs> um, so a, a couple of uh, comments about our flight. Um, Jim flew out from Sacramento a little before we did, like. 20 minutes, a half hour. And then uh, Rich and I got on the flight to Dallas. Everything was just great, except every seat was packed. Uh, there was no open seats in the plane. Uh, we got to Dallas and the plane we were supposed to get on um, had mechanical problems. So we waited two hours. They directed us to another plane that had more mechanical problems and we had to wait another hour or so. Uh, and it turned out it was a windshield wiper, who knew? That could stop a plane from flying. Um, and then we landed um, about three hours late in uh, beautiful McAllen, Texas. So why South Texas? Well, we're from Central California and pretty much anything outside of the valley is going to be interesting to us because we don't see it every day. Um, and specifically South Texas, because there's basically three kinds of birds that uh, attract our attention there. Um, they're not particularly rare or even uncommon in South Texas, but for us in the Central Valley, uh, it's pretty cool to see a curved-billed thrasher, Viraloxia, Crested Caracara, and so on. And that was a lot of the time that we spent was photographing. Um, Rich and I combined for, I believe, somewhere around 16 or 17,000 images between the two of us. And the fun part was getting uh, all of my images down to a presentation I could do in 35 minutes. So what I've done with this presentation is basically I'm covering our first day's adventure out in the field as we arrived at South Padre Island. And then the rest of the time, I kind of just focus on the different conditions that we found there, different days. Uh, we went elsewhere many other days, but we, we spent three full days on South Padre Island. <clears throat> so one group of birds would be the regional desert and shrubland birds. Another group of a large number of species that would be new or unusual for us would be what we call the neotropical migrant birds. Um, those are the pretty little warblers and buntings and grosbeaks and even yellow-billed cuckoos uh, that spend the winter in Mexico and South America and then fly up mostly through the eastern side of Texas and over Cuba and Florida and to parts north of there. Lots of neotropical migrant birds. And um, I pulled, pulled a video off of uh, the internet from eBird. And this kind of shows the route that, in this case, Baltimore Orioles would take. You see right now it's January. They're in 
from Southern Mexico through to Panama. And then as I click play on this, we will see the months go by and the movement of the birds kind of quickly goes up the coast over the Gulf, up into Canada, and then they turn around and come right back down the same way. So each time you look at that, it's kind of repeating. You see this narrow band kind of right through the southern tip of South Texas, and they just kind of funnel right through there. Now, I have another bird that we came across, uh, a black pole warbler that has a, a little bit different here, there we go, uh, migration pattern. They winter in Northern South America. And when I click play, you're gonna see that they fly up through Cuba, Florida, and the East Coast, but then watch what happens on the way back down. I found this to be quite interesting. So, oh, how did I get back there? There we go, all right, I need to play. So movement starts coming North and suddenly they, fly across and go right up into Canada. But when they come back down, interesting, when they migrate, they hit about North Carolina and they fly out into the Atlantic Ocean and go south from there. Nobody seems to know why they don't actually migrate back down through Florida, but that's their unusual migration pattern. So those are neotropical migrants, lots of them. Again, wintering in the tropics and migrating north in the spring and back down south in the fall. And then we have what we would call the Texas specialty birds. Um, birds that really are found almost nowhere else um, in the United States, largely just the southern very tip along the Rio Grande. And that would be birds like green jay, clay colored thrush. I almost call it clay colored robin because my first bird that I saw was a clay colored robin. And then it got a name change. And ring kingfisher. So what I've done when I, when I start showing photos of the birds, I've included uh, a little map like you see here for these three birds that kind of shows you their range. And um, on the specialty birds, I added the little Texas state icon. Okay, specialty birds. Uh, I'm not gonna read all of the bullets, but you can see there, there's about 18. Um, and depending on who you talk to, that list might have too many or not enough. And then you have the really super specialty birds, the very rare ones that people track very carefully and have as number one on their list. And of this list, we tried for all six of them, and we found one. So I guess that's a success. Okay, so where we stayed is the red circle is Harlingen and we stayed in the Hampton Inn there and that was our center for the entire trip. Uh, with the exception of when we went up to Falcon Reservoir up near Salineño and Chapeño, um, that was the one long trip, but almost all of the others were within half hour, 45 minutes from our hotel. And the first day, oh, back in a little bit, um, there's two large ecosystems that kind of cover central and south Texas. It's largely shrublands. And then of course you get close to the prairie, I mean, to the, uh, to the ocean and you have Gulf Prairie and Marsh. And then within that there's smaller habitats, um, ecosystems. And mostly what we had out on South Padre would have been the, the brackish tidal flat, uh, a few areas of deciduous shrublands, which were very important for the birds. Um, basically, really not any freshwater marsh because it's all pretty brackish or saltwater. In fact, um, the Laguna Madre is one of the saltier locations. I think it's in the top six hyposaline areas where it's saltier than the surrounding ocean. Um, but we'll kind of skip over there now. All right, so um, each of the days we plotted ahead looking at the forecast. And here's an example for day two, our first real day out in the field. Uh, we're looking at moderately warm weather, 
and south winds, which are the prevailing winds in South Texas. Um, and they might be anywhere usually from 10 to actually in one day it was 35 to 40 miles an hour. And birds love that, that are migrating from the south because they kind of just jump up in the air uh, late afternoon and jet with the wind up to North America. So our first day was just basically a typical warm kind of windy day. And we started off with my number one target bird. And that was at the Brownsville landfill. And I must say that it is one of the most scenic and natural areas that we went to the entire trip. Okay, I'm lying. It is a landfill and it is smelly and it is ugly, but it has birds. As you can see here, um, lots and lots of birds. And in I fact, what I need to jumps. do really quick, I need to turn on the volume, make sure I can share the volume. So hang on just a second. I'm gonna have to get out of here. Uh, let me see if I can do this. I'm gonna have to stop share real quick, sorry. Uh, Oh, you know what? I don't have that. Sal, do you have the ability to turn on volume for me? No, huh? Oh. Not, not from my end, Jim, sorry. You're gonna play a video that's got volume, that's got very calls in it? Yeah. It should be fine. Uh, oh, well, yeah. we'll go, Talk we'll go. No. All right, so. That's a video of all of the we, laughing girls. You can hear they're laughing at us. Uh, maybe yeah. you can't hear. No, but you that's have to reshare this. Yeah. All right. We'll skip it. Um, so as we looked around, of course, we're looking for the Tamalipas crow. Uh, it's a pretty rare bird, but they had been reported as many as I think six or eight the previous week. So we were pretty confident that we'd find that. Yeah, small yeah. crow, dark colored bird. Jim, Jim, you have to share the screen. Oh, you're out hold of on. Yeah. We'd love to see that crow. I have never seen it. I'm sure many yeah, people. Yeah, I'm trying to get out here. Sorry. Okay. Share, share screen. screen with us. All right. And, and we're back. Oh, hold on. Oh. My presentation is gone. It sure is. Sorry, hang on. I'm going to have to restart. Okay. I don't know what happened to it. All right, let me see if I can quickly. All right, so you can see the screen, correct? Yes. Is it on your desktop? Yeah. Just click on to it. it. Says take a break on Zoom. All right. Zoom share. Oh, come on. I think you have to minimize this window, don't you? Okay, can you see the... Uh... Yes, there it is. There, there it is. we go. All right. Oh, man. Listen to those birds. Okay, I'm going to ask everybody to mute, mute. Everybody mute please. All right. So, um, as I said, we started looking for a, a black bird, uh, crow sized, and we see oh. lots of. Grackles, no, not the blackbird we're looking for. And then there's, oh, there's brown-headed cowbirds. No, not the one we're looking for. And then we see this kind of crow looking bird, uh, larger here, you can see kind of left of center. Wow. Yeah. Sorry. And then I see it, I'm sure I have it. And I pointed it out to Rich and Jim and I said, Rich, take some photos. He's next to that blue piece of trash. And he says, OK, I'm taking pictures, but I don't see the bird. And I said, yeah, it's right next to the blue trash. See it? It's got the right shape and bill. And 
So we looked at his photos and I realized, okay, that's mistake number one for the trip. Moving on. Yeah. Oh, that no. wasn't what you were looking for. Not, not a bird. No. Please, please, uh, mute, please mute yourself, participants. Please mute yourself. And, please and mute. then uh, I miss ID the Chihuahua Raven briefly until we realized, okay, that bill is way too big and that bird's too big. But in, our, in my excitement to find what I wanted to see, I was sure that this was Tamalipas crow, but it was not. It was a Chihuahua Raven. And then Aww. we saw more blackbirds, larger. Uh, no, not the one we're after. This would be black vultures. But we got distracted by crested caracaras. Aww. And they are quite the colorful bird with the face, a little close up. You can see that eye color and the face color kind of blend in. and. Uh, the tip of the That's bill, beautiful. very, very cool bird, very cool bird. That's so we beautiful. are excited. Uh, Jim, I'm going to stop a second and mute everybody and then you can open yourself up. So I'm going to mute everybody. Okay, now, uh, Jim, go ahead and unmute yourself. Ah, got it. All right, back again. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. All right, yes. thanks. Okay. All right, and then we think we have it. Long ways away, stick on, sticking up on a branch. This could be it. Get a little closer. Bill looks about right. It's not the big honking bill that you see on a Chihuahua Raven. And sure enough, we found us a Tamalipas crow. You see, that's not that giant bill that the raven has. Right size, right color. And we had some very happy campers. In fact, Rich on the left picture is pointing at the bird. You, can, you really can't see it, but it's on the stick right in the center between the two gates. Um, that's the Tamalipas crow. So that happened to be Jim Roth's birthday. And it was his only life bird for the whole trip. So it was his birthday present. It was pretty exciting. Okay, from there, we went to um, another bird that we had hoped to see, which would be a life bird for myself. And we got to Laguna Tascosa. And on eBird, it's listed as the Aplomato Falcon Viewing Area. And if you can see way off in the distance, there's a telephone pole. And I know you can't see it but there is actually an Aplomato falcon sitting on the edge. And that was as close as we got. So I have a 500 millimeter lens and this is cropped down as much as I possibly could and still see the bird. So it was a long ways away. So from there, we decided to go to the Laguna Grande, Laguna Vista, I'm sorry, Laguna Vista Nature Trail. I heard about it on Facebook. Uh, a lot of people said it's it's a less known location, and we had kind of a hard time finding it. And it actually has kind of two entrances, um, but it's just across the bay from South Padre Island, which is where we ended up going. Uh, it's got some really nice walking trails, benches to sit on. There's three observation blinds. And each observation blind has its own water fountain and feeders. There's oranges put out for the birds. And here we can see Rich on the top left and then Jim and Rich on the top right, taking advantage of the observation blinds to take photos, which include this gorgeous gray catbird. A male on the left and female on the right, golden fronted woodpecker. You really can't see the tip of the tail to see the, the namesake for it, but this is the white tipped dove. Looks kind of like a chunky short tailed version of our morning dove. And then a thrasher. This happens to be 
the long build thrasher. The other thrasher that we had later on was the curved build thrasher. And here's a little uh, sparrow that's kind of all over the place down there, kind of an olive greenish yellow tail. This is the olive sparrow. Again, you can see on the map on the upper right that its general distribution really is just South Texas for the US. And here we get into what are known as the Myarchus flycatchers. Our local flycatcher in this genus is the ash-throated flycatcher. This is the one that we get in the US with the largest bill, brownish crest. It is the brown crested flycatcher. And there are two kind of similar uh, couches and tropical kingbirds in Southern Texas. Uh, this is the one that we found in most of the locations we went to. It's got a kind of a stubbier, thicker bill. This is the Couch's Kingbird. It has a more of a yellowish belly than our Western flycatcher or the Cassin's, I'm sorry, Western Kingbird or, or Cassin's Kingbird. They're more of a whitish yellow paler colored belly. And of course there was more than birds there. Uh, I believe this is a yellow bellied Eastern racer or Eastern yellow bellied racer and a Texas horned lizard. We saw lots of, um, other lizards as well that I did not ID. And another one of our target birds, the beautiful colored green jay, that beautiful blue, green back, yellow in the tail. It's just a gorgeous, gorgeous bird. South Texas special. So from there, we went into uh, Laguna Vista for lunch. We happened to stop at the Baby Boomers Bar and Grill. Was kind of a nothing looking place to me, but they had the most awesome fish tacos and I keep trying to find some just like it here in Modesto wow. and I'm not having any luck. Okay, so near there, we got out and walked around a park and we're on the west side of the uh, big Laguna Madre Lagoon. And we saw several turns and gulls, um, they were all laughing gulls that we saw pretty much. Uh, the turns, there were a couple of sandwich turns off to the left. I saw uh, a royal turn. I thought, well, I'm gonna get a, a picture of the, two, of the two royal turns. And again, this is way out using my big lens. And then when I got home, I realized I had to go back in and change my checklist because that's not two royal turns. It's a royal turn on the right, but the left one with the thicker orangish bill is actually a Caspian turn. We saw more of them later, so this was not the only one. Okay, so from here we decided it wasn't really originally planned this way, but we decided we're going to head over to South Padre Island. And you can see on the right, it's a sliver of land. It's a barrier island that goes kind of joins in with all of the barrier islands and goes all the way up the coast. Um, and on the left, the Laguna Madre is the very saltier part. And then the Gulf is on the right. And we drove across through Port Isabel. And the first stop was Valley Land Fund Lots. And I had always heard of it as Sheep's Head. And I couldn't find the name Sheep's Head until I realized it's on Sheep's Head Drive. Um, Valley Land Funds uh, has taken over several lots that would have been used for housing. And they have a lot of very dedicated volunteers that keep it in shape. And I especially want to give a shout out to the volunteers that go in and daily put out new fresh cut oranges for the birds because the birds go through a pretty hectic travel coming up from the tropics. So since 1987, Valley Land Fund has worked in partnerships with public organizations, private individuals and groups. This is a real large collaboration of people, of funding and a lot of hard work by volunteers to keep these two areas up and running and especially with Weather as it passes through, there's a bit of cleanup and these volunteers put in a lot of work. 
So another uh, bird that we got there was the great kiskadi. There's a couple of, uh, this is a, a migrating bird that we saw several of different times, it's Dick Sissel. Here is one of the more unique Orioles that we have in the States. Uh, most of the others are some theme of yellow or orange. This one, the male has got the very dark head, which is kind of typical, but it has a real rusty dark brown body. This is the orchard Oriole. And we had lots of bluebirds. Uh, let, me, let me rephrase that, okay, small b. Um, there were lots of these birds pretty much everywhere we went, indigo buntings. Uh, these happen to be males, and you can see they're kind of in the process of uh, molting out of some of their winter plumage. And there were lots of these orioles. So here's your typical yellowish orange theme with a black head. This happens to be the Baltimore Oriole, and this is a male. And here's a couple of tanagers that we had there. And this, uh, the top left tanager was uniquely colored. I had never seen one like that. It was this iridescent glowing orangish red. Most of the other scarlet tanagers that I have seen are truly bold red. This one was this fluorescent orangish red color. And then we did have a couple of Western tanagers. And this was one of my favorite birds that we had fly in. Um, we got a couple of shots. This is probably about as, as best as I could get. Uh, Yellow-billed cuckoo. We saw and or heard several of them. In fact, we heard quite a few later on in the week. Yellow-billed cuckoo. Uh, a couple more tanagers. The, they're the same species. The left one's the male, right one's the female. Those are summer tanagers. Quite a difference in color between the, the, the sexes. And lots of warblers. This is a male chestnut sided warbler. And this is what frequently I heard called a Maggie. Oh, there's a Maggie. I hear people say several times. Uh, this is a magnolia warbler. And here's a male and female version of the same species. This is an American red start. Male on the upper left, female on the bottom right. The female's a lot duller, browner colored, uh, but they typically flash their tails. You really can't see it in these photos, but they do a lot of tail flashing. They have a lot of uh, striping coloration in the, in the base of their tail. And here's one that I had shown before. This is a, a different day, probably a different bird. Uh, this is a, a male orchard oriole. And from there, we drove down to the convention center. And a little bit about the convention center, it, uh, it's free. Um, not that the World Birding Center, which is literally right next door, is expensive. And it certainly has uh, a lot to offer uh, birders and visitors. Um, I think it costs four or $5 a person was all. Uh, but this is typically birded more, uh, I guess, because it's free and uh, some nice decorations around the building. But the key for the birds coming up to South Padre Island is things that they're looking for is a place to land and rest, find food and find water. Now, South Padre Island is surrounded by salt water and saltier water when you get into the uh, Laguna Madre area. So they are in desperate need of fresh water. And this location does provide uh, a trail, of course, but here's the, the fresh water. There's a nice uh, water feature that starts right underneath the, the hummingbird feeder and runs downhill slightly to another little pond at the bottom. And this is constantly being um, visited by little warblers, vireos and buntings and such that are looking for some fresh water. Uh, towards the back, anybody that's gone there recognizes this location. Uh, there's a nice cement area there that you can stand underneath uh, the bright blue um, column there. 
and there's restrooms right there. It was just like the perfect place to set up. And what was nice is they have that little uh, rope um, and pretty much everybody stayed behind it. I didn't see anybody go over it. And most people learned that if you stand actually on the cement, even a little further away, the birds came right up close to you. And I guess my recommendation would be is to, you know, um, leave the birds their space and it actually benefits everybody if from everybody just kind of hangs out on the, on the cement there. Uh, the nature trail goes out. It's uh, I think three quarters of a mile or something like that. And the birds and critters are used to people walking all around the boardwalk. Here we can see Jim and Rich photographing. I'm not sure what could have been a bittern, could have been a sora, I don't remember, but I thought it was funny because the black-bellied whistling duck was just standing there watching us, which is what these are, black-bellied whistling ducks. And this guy is similar to a mallard. If you look at the females, they look very similar. This is actually a model duck. Um, model duck, Mexican duck, mallard, they're, they're kind of three sides, the same looking bird. They have a lot of similar features, uh, but DNA wise, they're different. And here's a bird that I had hoped for. It was going to be a lifer for me, and it turned out that we saw three of them uh, on this trip, three different locations. Um, this is a morning warbler. And unfortunately, my pictures aren't very good because this bird was constantly moving and it was dark. Uh, so there's my excuses for my pictures, but uh, definitely a morning warbler. There's no eye ring, very dark throat, grayish head, yellow belly, warbler size. Definitely a, it was a thrill because this was actually lifer number three for me for the trip. Another male Baltimore Oriole, some more indigo buntings, black and white warbler made a brief appearance. It's a female. Here's a bird that's related to, closely related to the morning warbler and to the um, McGillivray's warbler and Connecticut warbler. They're fairly close and kind of close looking. This is the, actually a Nashville warbler, which we have here. Um, Ibis, frequent the area. We had several white ibis. This is, happens to be an adult. Rose-breasted grosbeak. And we had one of those here nearby recently out in Waterford, uh, the River Park. Uh, I was going to say found by Gary Hayes. It wasn't found by Gary Hayes. He refound it, but it was found originally by somebody else. I'm sorry, I don't remember their name. Tricolored herons. They used to be called Louisiana. I put that in there as a reminder for us old folks that have been birding for a while. And uh, one of my favorite birds, again, uh, such a unique history to these black skimmers, the way they plow through the water looking for little minnows and such. It's fascinating to watch. And very tough to get a good photograph of because they are constantly moving. Interesting bill, no? That bottom mandible is longer. It has to be because it absorbs the, the pressure from dragging it through the water and it wears faster. Uh, several sandpipers that we encountered. Uh, this was a, an almost breeding plumage stilt sandpiper. And here's a bird that we get here, um, but I just love yellow-headed blackbirds. Um, the male especially has just this bold yellow head and dark black body and they have just the most weird call, I think, of any bird that I know. And just passing along, the, the scientific name is interesting, kind of redundant. It's Xanthocephalos xanthocephalos is its genus and species. Xantho means is a reference to the yellow pigment. Cephalos is a reference to head. So it's yellowhead, yellowhead, yellowhead and blackbird. Uh, turns, this is the 
least tern that we managed to see flying over us. And here is a, another one of my favorite herons. Uh, this is a, uh, I'm sorry, in the heron family, correcting myself, it's an egret. And this is the adult reddish egret. And sometimes it's not so reddish as it is whitish. This is a white form, same bird, reddish egret. This just happens to be the white form, same species. Uh, cormorants, we had both double crested and this guy that you want to look for the little white on the chin uh, right at the base of the bill. Uh, it's a little bit smaller than the double crested and this would be the neotropic cormorant. And my friends Ralph Baker and Rich Brown found the only Stanislaus County record of this species out at Woodward Reservoir two years ago, I believe it was. Neotropic cormorant. Uh, another bird that ended up being a life bird only because I wasn't 100% sure when I had seen them before and this time I got photos. Uh, very long primary shorebird, um, a little bit bigger than a Western sandpiper, uh, white on the rump when it flew, and that makes it a white rump sandpiper. And that was my last lifer for the trip. I got them all, all four of them on the first day that we were out birding. After that, it was just Fun, 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 fun. Okay, so after the convention center, we went out to the mud flats, which is right next door. Got a few more lease turns, another set of skimmers, more royal turns, cool little crest on their heads. And then the little guy on the right, so you have the three on the left, which are the royal turns and then the little guy with the yellow tip is a sandwich turn and I just had to throw this in there. These are all sandwich turns as well. Okay uh, the next morning I want to do a little fill in in between. We ended up going back to South Padre Island but in between uh, we had an adventure to the um, Sabal Palm Grove Sanctuary and um, we got to see the border wall. Kind of give you a, a, an idea on how big it was. I superimposed the other photo in with this one. And, and I was supposed to be the great planner and know all of the details. And guess what day we went out there? Yes, it was Wednesday. So we had a very quick visit to the entrance of Sabal Palm Sanctuary. And then from there, we took a drive down to Boca Chica Beach and got to see the SpaceX Space Center. And I still can't believe that that thing actually flies, the thing on the left. I saw a video of it the other day, crazy. Um, and then I got the news via text that my mother had passed away. So that was kind of a, a downer day uh, on that particular day. But moving on, we ended up going to Olivera Park, and we spent an hour and a half there wondering where are the parrots. We heard all the stories about parrots and oh, we're not going to see it. We're going to miss it. We can't find them. Where are they? And then we found a couple of green parakeets, and then we finally saw two um, red, red crown, I believe is the name, uh, parrots. And we thought, man, this is it. I've heard that there's hundreds here. But by the time it got dark, there were hundreds. And it was noisy and loud and parrots all over the place. And then we went to another spot. And we had kind of a bummer day there. Poor Jim lost his telescope. They broke into our car, stressed us all out. But in the end, it was stuff. And it was replaceable. And we got a bright red truck so we really felt like we were in Texas. Okay so here's the forecast for the rest of the week. Uh, you can see that um, on the 28th it was going to be very windy from the south meaning birds were just pretty much going to fly right over us. Same thing on the next day and then you can see on which I believe was um, Friday and Saturday the 30th and the 1st that there was a little shift in the winds. They were no longer from the south they were coming from the north so we were kind of excited about that change in the winds. And uh, hopefully you can hear this. Bill, don't say no. I'm going to Texas. I'm getting on a plane right now. Texas? You just got back. Bill, there's going to be major fallout in a few hours. Nuclear fallout? Bird, bird fallout. 
What are you talking about? I'm talking about a major storm hitting the Gulf of Mexico in the middle of migration season. I'm talking about headwinds and downpours and 100,000 birds literally dropping from the sky. I'll put it down as a sick day. Okay, that's one of my favorite movies. Um, and that's, of course, Jack Black talking about a bird fallout. And about a week, uh, a little over a week before we were there, this was showing you the wind conditions and how they changed. Uh, you can see typically from the south, southeast, and then on Saturday, the winds changed, but they were pretty solid, eight to 14 to 13 to 15 miles an hour for two solid days, wind coming from the north. So what happens is the birds take off from the southern part of the Gulf just before midnight, I mean, I'm sorry, just before sunset, jump into that breeze and just ride it up to North America, like I said. But if they hit a headwind, if they hit rain, uh, it, it wears them out and it wears them out fast. And the longer the wind lasts and the stronger the wind, the more it affects the birds. And this image by Mary Voltz, and she has, I think, two more that she posted on Facebook, and I, and I include this with her permission, shows what it was like for the birders that went to the convention center. Uh, they were just everywhere. Um, you can see here, there's Baltimore Orioles, Orchard Orioles, Indigo Buntings, there's a rose-breasted grosbeak beak in the back. Uh, but this was pretty much what it was like. And I had another gentleman share an image with me uh, of a previous fallout in the spring of 2012. And there were thousands of Baltimore Orioles all over the place. So I include this image to show you how important the volunteers are for these poor birds struggling to just survive. Uh, you can imagine how long it takes to get these oranges, to get them split, to get them placed up in the tree cleaned up again at the end of the day or the next day and then repeat the process over again. And I am a firm believer that without these volunteers, there would be thousands of dead birds instead of live birds flying up to nest. So here we go, typically taking off, as I said, wind at their backs, pushing them forward. They get the wind in their face. It pushes them off to the coast to the shoreline, to any place that they can land and get water and rest. So we started off with the anticipation that maybe we would get lucky like they did a week and a half ago um, for the birders, that is not so much for the birds. Um, and you can see the skies here. We're at the um, plaza, the south end of um, South Padre Island. I'm sorry, I didn't slip my mind at the moment. And we took a walk out. We were tracking, trying to find an American oyster catcher. Again, you can see the skies and we are anticipating a rainy, windy, stormy day. And of course, we never stopped photographing. And here's Rich taking images of Lee's turn. Looks like that on the sand. And you can see the the flag warning system and we were red flag and the wind at this point was coming from the east. And here we got to the birding center. Uh, uh, there was a gentleman there who came and took the photos for us. Love this place. They have great birds and they have really big monarch butterflies. Fresh water attracts the birds. Cool bird list. You have to check that out when you're there. And I, I think I'm going to have to speed this up. I personally didn't include as many photos because I knew it was going to take a while. Uh, I'll go a little faster. So there's a nice boardwalk that goes out through the, uh, the marsh area. Lots of black mangroves, lots of trees for the birds to settle in. Green herons nesting and they're all over the place down there. Uh, and here was one of the stars that we were looking for. We had one male green kingfisher. Uh, and to be honest, this is the only image that I took in this whole presentation that I doctored up. There was actually a branch running right behind its eye and cut its head in half. And it, I just didn't like the branch. I got rid of it. So this is not a competition presentation. So I figured you wouldn't mind because it's such a gorgeous bird, green kingfisher. Um, more of these warblers. 
Tennessee warblers. This is black pole warbler male. Northern water thrush, saw many of those. A lot of these, you know what? I didn't have a photo. As many times as I've been back east, I didn't have a photo of a ruby-throated hummingbird. So there I have it, ruby-throated. Uh, Tricolored heron. And here was another star for the day that we were excited to find and photograph. He posed for us quite well. This is the purple gallinule. Two different birds here. On the left is a young white ibis. And then on the right is a cattle egret. There is a, I believe this must be a female or first year male, perhaps Canada warbler, complete eye ring. It's got a little necklace collar going on. Again, another, this was originally lifer for me, the morning warbler, see the, the black bib, gray head, yellow belly. Uh, Baltimore Orioles, indigo buntings, female on the left. And we decided to head back out towards the point to the little uh, bird blind on the end, hoping that as we walked along looking up, we might see something unusual fly overhead. And sure enough, we got our one and only magnificent frigate bird fly overhead that day, lousy photo. I think Rich has got a much better photo than I do on this guy. Another one of my favorites. I have lots of favorites, could you tell? Uh, least bittern, posing for us. And then the rain got heavier and heavier. Jim Ralph on the top, smarter, standing under the protection of the rain. And no, I stood out in the rain and got wet. Um, but it was kind of funny uh, looking at the sightings. And um, for some reason, the ones under uh, April 30th are kind of worn away there. Uh, we might have accidentally bumped up against the board. Sorry, guys. OK, and this guy popped out. It's the only picture I got there when it was pouring rain is a gray catbird. And then we had some summer tanagers. And as I was photographing a lesser nighthawk, uh, I believe it was Jim Ralph, he yelled at me, he says, Jim, turn around. And I turned around and literally two and a half feet from me was this scarlet tanager feeding on an orange, had no idea. And so of course I had to photograph it. Um, so there's the scarlet tanager. Uh, here you can see three Tennessee warblers on the oranges in the middle of the rain. Black throated green warbler. He's looking at us. Again, in the rain, eastern wood peewee. There's a lesser nighthawk I was trying to photograph. Here's a quiz question for you. What bird is this? Notice the distribution is all over pretty much most of uh, the US. This is a national warbler. More Baltimore Orioles. Uh, female on the top and male at the bottom, same species, rose-breasted grosbeak. This is the, the twin to the couches kingbirds that were all over. Um, they're kind of hard to ID and one of the pro expert guys that was there that knew every bird by sound and by feather said that this was a tropical kingbird. So I took a lot of photos and that's the best I can get of the longer, thinner bill. And here's a relative of the robin. This is a wood thrush. And this we saw probably 30, 40, maybe more female versions of this species, which this is what these are. And these are painted buntings and we never saw a male the whole time we were there. We saw all female painted buntings, nice kind of a limey greenish yellow color. And so here we were pretty much at the end of the rainy days. It wasn't quite a true fallout. It was a very heavy day of birding, lots of birds. Um, and we had decided that that was it. The next morning we were heading up to Salineño Chapeno area, and we were calling it quits. We kind of finished up our eBird checklist and walked to the car. And as we were getting in the car, I saw a flock of seagulls. Oh, did I say that? I couldn't resist. Um, and so, yes, there was a flock of gulls. 
And uh, a closer inspection, you can see a nice little black and white marking on the tips of the wings, the black head. And these are Franklin's gulls. There was, I don't know, 150 of them, I think, in the flock flying over us. So we ended our day with uh, Franklin's gull, which was nice. And there's no way I could continue on with the rest of the antics and be uh, within my time limit. So to be continued at some time in the future, or maybe Rich and I, or maybe Rich will do another version, but there's a lot more birds that we saw as we moved inland. And that concludes my presentation. All right, thank you so much, Jim. Let's go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and applaud or give thumbs up and or reveal your faces and I'll start with mine. Huzzah, huzzah. Huzzah, thank you for watching. Thank you. Thank beautiful, you. Nice, Jeff. Beautiful, beautiful photographs. Really nice uh, setting for them in the range maps and everything, Jim. Excellent. Uh, I'm What I'm going to do, I, I do have an announcement to make, but I want to share something with you. If you have a moment, as I hope you do, which is what happens if your friend says, oh, I heard there was a good program. Where can I see it? Well, what you're seeing on my screen is the Stanislaus Audubon Society website. And I believe it's under events and it's under programs. And you can see, I think you can all see the page now, correct? This yes. is online programs and Jim has put together a beautiful uh, page uh, of about nine or 10 of the programs if you have missed any. And the one that he's currently recording will be added to this very shortly. Speaking of which, are we stopped recording?